Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. So welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today, our guest is Bashir Riachi. Now, Bashir is a dynamic sales leader that's established an extensive and broad portfolio of sales, both B2B and B2C, spanning across 18 years of experience, ranging from globally recognized brands and fast-moving consumer goods, sort of like the Coca-Cola company, to industrial safety supplies materials such as Blackwoods. So he's been servicing Australia's biggest corporate clients in that space. Now, over the years, he's successfully stimulated stability, growth, and business planning within his many roles by transmission of vision to reality, mission into achievements, and philosophy into accomplishments. And prior to his successful sales career, Bashir was a graduate of ECU, Edith Cowan University, and graduated with a Bachelor of Education. So he practiced as a teacher for four years in both the public and private education sectors. And prior to embarking into the business world, that was where he was sort of sitting. So once he came into the business space, though, he opened some of the Southwest's most known hospitality venues and then launched into his corporate career with Coca-Cola. And there he spent 14 years. So this career started in Perth with him later then relocating to Melbourne, where he now resides with his family. Now, Bashir's most recent professional role was at Blackwood's biggest industrial safety, sorry, was at Australia's biggest industrial safety supply business, Blackwood's, which is a West West Farmer's owned business. And there he was the national sales manager looking after industrial, mining, retail and government. Bashir has developed a strong reputation for gaining respect through exercising discretion, sound judgment, and a professional hands-on approach. Bashir's experience has seen a desire to create and implement strategies that are closely aligned to business goals and objectives, a design to achieve best practice management solutions for his internal and external stakeholders as well. So Bashir's key strengths include p and management, communication, strategic leadership, and people development problem solving, project management, relationship development, negotiation, and achieving and exceeding desired business performance combined with that results-driven and people-first approach. Bashir is a life partner to Kirsten, a stepdad to Kale and Bo, and he's the captain of Bomaris Lawn Tennis Club, men's division, nine penance team, and spends most of his weekends either on the tennis court or in the family kitchen. Bashir is a proud first-generation Lebanese-Australian and has called Australia home for 35 years. Welcome, Bashir. No, I'm just, thank you. That uh, who is that guy? Yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, we are getting old. Uh, that's that's what it tells me. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that warm welcome, and yeah, great to be here. Thanks for the yeah. invite. No worries. It's great. It's great to have you. And I think the older we get, the longer the bio gets, right? And then we're going to try oh. and cut little bits out of it. <laughs> It was like uh, when you start listening to that, you go, did I do all those things? Yes. And then, yeah, and yeah but uh, yeah, I've been very, very fortunate uh, to have had a wonderful and continue to have a wonderful life. And uh, since the family moved here from Wartorn, Beirut, from Beirut to Bunbury. Wow. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, haven't looked back really. So very, very lucky. So you spent a lot of times in those leadership positions, right? Like even as a teacher, you're a leader, the businesses that you opened up um, in the sales space. I I suppose, can we start off with um, trust and accountability is really important. So how do you feel like that plays into the leadership of people? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, they're, they're sort of the components to me, or what, what I would describe as the sort of the ingredients, if we put in a cooking sense, you know, uh, I love food. Um, they're the two, you know, staples, ingredients that one must have in any any partnership, in my view, um, in any yep. partnership. It's a relationship, 
um, whether it's a business partnership or 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 you're leading teams or leading an organization. Um, trust is 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 one of those baselines that if you without it, that you don't have a foundation. And then the accountability piece comes in um, in that uh, people uh, we we like to be accountable. We like to to know when things happen. We like to we like to also know when our commitments are due, when when things need to be done. So uh, combining the two by having trust and an accountability uh, that that helps you then then build the rest of the components of of a partnership. The transactional bit comes in, and then the exchange, in the business sense, that starts happening. The value exchange. So, uh, but for me. Um, I've learned very early, um, you know, maybe it's the the, the immigrant, um, you know, sort of um, messaging that came through from my parents is that this person is a trusted, trustworthy person. Yeah. This person, we don't know the stranger. Uh, these Aussies, we don't know much about them. We've got to, you know, make sure we stay close to our Lebanese friends. And so you have this sort of trust um theme that came through from a very early age, you know, mm. whether it was working in mum and dad's cafe in yeah. Bunbury. Uh, to then, you know, building that trust and that loyalty through the customers that were would continue to patron, you know, patron in the mum and dad's business, um, and then you know them having this form of accountability that they re- rely on these people to come because they give us money for the food that we're exchanging. So, yeah. so that's sort of been a theme for me throughout my life, uh, whether it was come through family and then through. You know, when I when I was given these great opportunities to stand in front of children, you got to build trust to to have mm. that exchange of you know the curriculum and the information sharing and you know you're, you're entrusted you know by parents to, to look after their children for those hours and you're accountable to yeah. deliver <laughs> they, the parents want to see you they want to see the children improve in your care so yeah. you, you take that theme into their business it's no different you know people are you know whether it's um, working for coca-cola and people want to buy the product from you they want the product to, to be delivered on time yeah, and they they want it accurately invoiced and not 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 charge more than what they thought they would pay, and so they can then on sell it to their consumers. Mm. Um, to dealing with a mining company who, you know, entrusting you with their business, and they need these critical safety components that allow their people to work safely underground without that without mm. that safety helmet or those safety shoes then they're not being accountable to their people, which then puts them in a compromised position. So trust, accountability, I've, I've realised in my life has been very, very important um, key components of any relationship. Mm, that's so pertinent. And, I, I mean, trust, everyone understands trust and, you know, ha- understands the word and knows where it comes from. But accountability, accountability can be tricky for people, right? So one of the things I've learned as a leader is people are scared of accountability a lot of the times because they feel like it's going to have come with punishments and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But moving into the entrepreneurial world, everyone I'm around loves accountability, right? So we've got accountability partners keeping ourselves on track. And I think it in the business sense, it's really important as a leader to reframe what accountability really means. And like you said, it's just giving direction. It's letting people know what the expectations are so that they can perform at their highest level, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's a, it starts with a definition, right? How do you, how do you, how does one define accountability? And I think if they're, if they're, if you get that sort of negative connotation to it, is people probably thinking accountability is, oh, he just wants me to do things for him. Yeah. You know, ask him, he's bossing me around, you know. Whereas, yeah. you know, when when you truly understand the meaning of accountability, it's actually it's a it's a it's a form of giving. It's mm. it's actually your 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 you're actually one's been accountable to self. Yeah. Uh, to turn, I'm, I'm accountable. We agreed to be here at ten. I'm going to be here a few minutes before because my time is not more important than yours. We all have important things in life, so being yeah. accountable to your commitments and it's, I guess, it's. Uh, I always see accountability is directly linked to communication. Yeah. Uh, how you communicate your expectations, and and can can give a different meaning to accountability. If you're just dumping stuff on people, then they're going to see you as. Who is this person? Why, why are they why are they hassling me? <laughs> but if you can communicate your vision and your strategy around accountability in a way that brings people along the journey and they feel very much part of that bigger picture, then accountability becomes a really easy conversation because you just you kind of trust in that person is going to do their bit. Mm. I'm trusting you to do your bit, I'll do my bit. You put those bits together, and we're gonna equal the sum of total. So 
Yeah. And coming from that people centered approach, right? So I was in HR for a long time and then moved into safety, but in HR, traditionally, when I first started, HR was about KPIs, hitting targets. It really wasn't as people focused or people centered as it should have been. And I think that's probably where the disconnect's happening because people are looking back and thinking of those traditional areas of HR when they were just brought into with a stick to hit people rather than realizing that this is empowering when we do accountability right. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And again, um, you know, having having spent many years in a corporate landscape similar to yourself in and and working very closely with with HR, you know, the definition of HR also, you know, one something that we can talk about. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, and what and how people view in business, whether it's a small business, medium sized enterprise or large scale corporation, mm. um, you know, the the function of HR has many, many roles and many responsibilities. And people think that HR is the stick that needs to be brought in, but it's actually a it's a resource. It's a it's another function, an organism of of the business that really is there to facilitate better exchange, better value, you know, the safer environments, you know, and 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 really ensure people are feeling, you know, they can be trusted and 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 really, you know, making people feel empowered to to come in and spend their time and 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 exchange the value and do their bit. Mm. So. Um, I did. Um, I had a role at Wally Parsons early on in my HR career, and I remember the people there. As I got to know them, they were like, "Oh, you actually aren't like a normal HR person." Yeah. Like, what do you mean? And well, and I kind of stuck out because I was so person focused. And I, I kind of what I think a good HR system does is it sits on the fence and it weighs up benefits for employees and the company so that everyone's a winner. Whereas I think traditionally it was all about the company. Right. There was human resources, but it wasn't about the people. It was Process. about the resources. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. True. True. And I worked, I've been very lucky. I've had some amazing people that I've worked with along, along the journey and some have come from, you know, HR backgrounds and, uh, you know, the, the, the components, whether it's HR, sales, marketing, you know, any function in any business is, you know, like I said, going back to, you know, you got to have trust and, and accountability, yeah. whether you're in HR or whether you're in the sales or in the, in the operations department, uh, but also underlying, you know, a capability. I, I talk a lot about this with teams around, if you had to look at job descriptions and and a, a, any any role that you're aspiring towards or or have interest in, you look at the uh, the capability statements or the job description and they'll, they'll list things they need to have be good at this and there'll be a technical element to it but fundamentally what doesn't get talked a lot about is those key key um key ingredients i'll refer back yes. to the ingredients is yeah. communication you know yeah. problem solving uh, or in you know in layman's term people having logic <laughs> being yeah. logical you know, applying some basic thinking process. You know, um, you know, having having a having an appetite and 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 attitude and aptitude to wanting to do things without being asked. Mm. Uh, so I think you know a good human resource function, uh, yes, provides some some structure and some guidelines and some process that you know enables people to function well, but also can be the really soft skills of around being you know getting people to become better communicators, facilitating change yeah. in a really engaging way. And and if something needs to be disciplined, then you can still discipline someone without being a tyrant, uh, yeah. without feeling like you're the primary school with the principal student yeah. with the principal coming and tell you for not wearing your school uniform. Yeah. You know? uh, so so yeah, they're 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 the sort of um that's the sort of the magic of any business really. And uh, the complexity of any business is they're some of the things we've got to deal with. Mm, yeah, no, definitely. And so what do you think are some of the significant leadership lessons that you've encountered or that have kind of made you a better person or a better leader? Um, there's a lot. I mean, like I said, I'm very yeah. fortunate. I think, uh, I think, you know, I've had, I've had the wonderful mix of, of people that have influenced my life when I, when I put the review mirror and reflect on, on life and the last 46 years, you know, family plays a very big, big important uh part in how i've been shaped yeah. uh, it's you know i'm the youngest of four you know I'm, I'm the last one that came out uh so i had three you know i had a sister and two older brothers um uh, that were you know all although i was the youngest they were share at, at their young age they were sharing their wisdom 
you yes. know, as the, as the youngest. So you kind of yep. get shaped very early, uh, and then you're forced to to fight hard for your for your voice as as the fourth child. Mm. Um, and then you know, you know, I'm the son of of two uh, wonderful Lebanese parents who who actually called this country home and and going through the journey of moving from a war torn country to a peaceful countryside town like Bunbury mm. where we grew up you know and 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 so the life lessons that my parents have had have shaped me as a person and I use a lot of those lessons whether it was the survival um skill set of just we need to fight just to get enough money to have food on the table and a roof over our heads yeah to you know to going into business and having a restaurant and having you know, uh, I recall vividly when I applied for my first bartender job at the good old Lord Forest Hotel. Yeah. And the lady asked me how many years of experience. And I, I was a skinny, scrawny 18 year old who just got their responsible service of alcohol certificate. And I said, I've got nine years experience. She goes, well, what age did you start? <laughs> and, I, and I said to her, I've been working hospitality for nine years. And I was nine yeah. years old when my parents bought the restaurant. And I wasn't lying. I was telling yeah. the truth. Yeah. You know, um, it wasn't child labor or anything like this, you know, abuse of child labor anyway, but it was, it, it was, was family just, business, right? That's what family, family business. Do. Yeah. We all had jobs to do, right? Yeah. Before school, before climbing the hill every day to the high yeah. school, I had to on go and hill. open the shop. You know, <laughs> you trauma response that? on the hill. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so, so, that, so parents, um, parents, uh, siblings have played a, a major part in, in the influence. And mm. then um, I've just been very lucky, like even through, you know, through university and and ECU, there's a number of people that really still stand stand to mind. Lecturers that you know sort of awaken the mind, awaken the soul. Moments, you know, there's guys like Paul Swan, you know, Sandra Woolthorton, you know, you know, Carol Hogan. Although I haven't spoken to these individuals for for two decades, the lessons that I learned in that beautiful Southwest campus have have really um you know in that in that in the education course um had really set me up for success at the time I didn't think it was yeah. I didn't think it was significant <laughs> but when when you obviously as years go on you look back and think oh there were, there were some really key moments in time so those people had an impact and then you know moving through my work professional life from the teaching days through the business days um you know significant you know senior teachers or principals who just you know, took a punt on a on a this young male graduate. You know, mm. who knew it all but had no idea. Yeah, <laughs> uh, gave, gave me a shot. You know, gave me a chance um, at teaching and 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 being you know to be able to stand there in front of children and and impart some knowledge um, to you know someone who's probably had a major impact on my life is is you know best mate who is no longer with us, which you know you know Michael Coot who mm. who was inseparable as kids and and mm. he he was he was when I look back at the lessons that I learned from Michael as a human um he he probably really uh, educated me on the risk-taking uh behavior and, and I, I recall decisions that he had made uh, to whether to leave high school to go and do hospitality at TAFE and then to get a job at the Lord Forest and then to go to other other establishments. Mm. I kind of, my first years at uni, I was just following him along. Yeah, I was nice. just going where he was going, you know, and then people thought we were inseparable because he was just opening doors for me and saying, yeah. take a risk, have a crack, do this. And I used to always go, are you sure about this? Is this going to be a good decision? <laughs> um, you know, and then we go in and we have a great time doing it. And that's why... You know, he was probably a really significant person, and I think mm. um, he um, losing him um, suddenly uh, was it was a huge shake up in my because I just lost someone who was, you know, my left and right arm, but also someone that you lean on and is your best friend. Mm. Um, and, then, and then through life, you know, relationships. Um, you know, I've got a, you know, I hope Kirsten doesn't listen to this, but she's the CEO and CFO and CEO at home, and and yeah. she's a full human being who who not only is a great life partner but also a great a great teacher and and someone that I respect not only as my partner but also respect from a professional sense that I've learned from her every day as well and, and hopefully I, I, I impart some form of knowledge back cross uh, fingers <laughs> cross fingers <I> hope. <laughs> uh, so um so there's a lot of significant moments and people and lots of lessons uh and if I put a line through all of them mm. 
as to what are the what are the consistencies that have come through and it's around connection around trust it's around yep. being accountable it's about turning up and showing up no mm. matter what the situation is it's about facing your challenges head on it's mm. about dealing with difficulty you know with with always with humbleness and with with respect of the other human that you're dealing with uh so that's uh that's kind of the, the things that have really had an impact on on me personal and professional life yeah uh, that's that's just great and i and i think sometimes we miss the fact that <clears throat> Our learnings come from everywhere. They don't just come from other leaders in our space. They come from all of our experiences. And and just my next, that is a beautiful segue into the next question. So what is the biggest obstacle that you've had to overcome, Bash, and and how did that strengthen your connection inward? Yeah. um, I touched on, I touched on, I guess, losing someone. Yeah. Uh, Probably the, the most significant people in my life that, that I've lost, um, uh, you know, you know, early thirties, a best mate who, yeah. who at the time, you know, we were planning a holiday together. We were actually on the four days before he passed, we were planning a golf trip. We were planning, mm-hmm. you know, you know, getting getting you know, uh, partners together at the time, having a holiday and 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 doing things and just sort of planning the, uh, you know, activities and things that you do yeah. as. as as, as a life. young you're planning life right you, yeah you don't planning life right to end like that yeah, yeah. so yeah. Uh, so that and then in more recently recent years losing mum unexpectedly you know who's been um i guess um when when i reflect on mum's life uh she's a tower of strength she's a matriarch of our family who was the you know the decision maker uh yeah. And uh, not dis- disrespecting my father anyway, he's he's still very much with us and still you know engaged and 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 very well alive. But uh, dad was the doer, mum was the the driver. Yeah, uh, and so that's how a partnership works, right? There's always yeah people that have those strengths. Yeah, yeah. So they had the you know married fifty two years together. You wow. know you know moved a family back and forth from Lebanon three or four times <laughs> until yeah. they realised that this is the place where we want to stay. Um, and so they're, they're, they're significant moments that I think, you know, losing losing loved ones, I think, mm-hmm. um, force you to look inwards, force you to, to you know, the grieving process, you know, allows you to, to reflect as w- what does their life mean for them and then what does it mean to you and to the loved ones that are still here to, to continue forward. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. Mm. Um, and then others that are the other component of influence, I would say professionally, people who have have you know come into your life for you know a reason, a season, or whatever whatever the saying is, you know some have stayed for a few weeks, some have stayed for months, and some are going to stay forever, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, I probably butchered that that analogy, but I think you know, <laughs> you know, know what, what I'm mean. saying. Yeah, we yeah know. Uh, so it's. Uh, it's those people, you know, who who you're sharing life with, whether it's your, you know, your your personal life or your professional life. Uh, mm. Like you said in your statement, um, you know, there are some key individuals that I can recall, mm. but I think I'm the sort of human that really enjoys working with people. So I try to learn and be engaged and be interested in every person I'm in contact with. So if I'm leading a team, I'm trying to learn from them, learn all their skills, learn learn how they do things. So then I can I can then help coach I can help you know guide and provide some wisdom or the other way around too. So mm. um, family loss, friend loss, significant um, milestones. You know, starting jobs, new jobs. You know, what, going into new organisations. That's always I find that really stimulating, and you 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 having to have everything in the radars on. You're ready to listen. You're ready to learn. You're ready to to work out where you fit. Um, and then, you know, in more recent years, you know, children, you know, they they create significant. Oh, they're great, aren't they? Yeah. They're they, really they create... great teachers. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. They really pressure test your 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 patience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number one, but two, your ability to communicate. Um, mm. 
completely yeah you know they 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 shoot from the hip and they shoot fast and mm. you you as a parent and as a as a as a step parent now um you know you 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 have to be on on alert to ready to respond and respond efficiently so you get the value exchange to happen <laughs> so. yeah and the the thing that amazes me with kids and and how we parent is you know we see them as these helpless little babies if if you're there for birth um or as they grow up as toddlers and and they're coming in and so there's a day where they turn into older people that have better cognition and and better ability to understand. But sometimes we're still seeing them as the little ones. So that's where it's hard sometimes to communicate and understand them and their frustration or ours on them, theirs on us. It's just such a huge learning curve, a lifelong lesson, I think, that we can get from them. Yeah. And, and how even, they change. Even more recently. Yeah, even even more recently, I, I, you know, in, in regards to your last question, you know, um, spent a few weeks back in the southwest. We've transitioned dad into an aged care facility. Um, yeah, you imagine you know um, a very stubborn Middle Eastern man who doesn't believe in, he doesn't understand, or hasn't a real um, uh, a high level awareness of what an aged care facility is. You know, in his yeah. mind, you know, family looks after family, and you know, yeah. till death will part. You know what I mean? On all, mm-hmm. all, all definitions of that. So, you know, having to move dad into a facility, isn't, there's an element of, oh, have we failed him in, in our cultural, mm. uh, 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 I guess, um, cultural being and cultural mm. awareness. And, you know, in a, as, as, a, as a Lebanese family, it's like, oh, God, do we, there's an element of, like, are, are we going to be shamed for, for sending yep. dad to a nice care facility? And then when you realise, you know, the journey of, of, um, of transition that he goes through once he's there and having spent the the two weeks with him recently as he transitioned and was there on a daily basis, meeting the people and seeing the carers, getting to know the facility and seeing dad awaken at 86 yeah. years old, see his, his mindset change to go, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. I'm not going to be just be dumped in a, in a room somewhere. I'm actually being looked after. There's services provided. There's a physio there if I need physical developmental support. Yeah. There's a 24 hour nurse available for medically. All of a sudden, safety, the safety and well being, uh, you know, um, uh, the safety and well being uh, product that they, they they have available has then had made him feel safe and feel at home and and quite comfortable and is engaging well with the with the other residents and engaging well with the carers. And it it sort of when I when I left there last week to come back home, um, it there was a sense of um, there was a sense of relief that yeah. okay he's no longer at home on his own. We every night my siblings and I'll be on on the phone. Has anyone checked in? Is he okay? Has the alarm gone off? Is he asleep? Is he as he's fallen over? Is yeah. he in the toilet? Is he in the shower? Like what what's going on to now? Going okay, we can focus on our life for a moment. That he's yeah. got really good care, and then the time that we spend with him now on we actually spend it on doing cool stuff. Let's just go for a coffee or let's go and see uncle so-and-so or mm. go for a drive to grab a burger rather than what care do you need? I'm, I'm in, I've got five minutes. Let's, what, what can I support you with? So yeah. the learning yeah. I took out of that process, Naomi, is that even at 86 and we're still able to transition and develop and, mm. and change and, and and deal with change like that's significant change for him huge yeah you know, for us um and and he's he's like we're, we're my siblings are looking at each other going uh, he's 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 all good all he's all up, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's all good like uh kick on yeah. so so they're they're significant um i think lessons that make you uh reflect and hey you know either give you hope or give you energy or give you a sense that we're okay. We're mm. okay. And and that connects really strongly to decisions in leadership, I believe. So what a, a gold nugget I took out of that is um especially from a HR background and leadership background, I often see people don't have conversations that they need to have, or they don't take action that they need to take because of how it kind of makes them feel. And if your family had have dwelled in that, how does it make us feel rather than what's actually the best outcome here? Then your your dad wouldn't have the social connections, the the well being in place, all of those things that are making him thrive. Right, he would have been surviving, but probably not thriving. Not thriving. And I think yeah. as as leaders, sometimes we miss that, and it's we don't realize that we're being really quite selfish 
instead of actually stepping up and serving the way that we should be serving. Like what's the best outcome, not what's going to make me feel good, right? Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. And I think um, I, when I say, you know, at the kickstart of the session, you know, I said I'm very fortunate and I think I am very fortunate. I've, I've actually had a lot of time to reflect and think about, you know, my life, you know, whether it's recently through dad's experience or just uh, as an ongoing, you know, um, I like to reflect on the daydream, like I said to you earlier. Yeah. I try and walk every day. Uh, if not every day, it's a few times a week. Yeah. Um, and during that that walk, you know, I, I'm reflecting and thinking about the past, but also thinking about the future and planning and prodding and just sort of creating pathways. Um, uh, look, um, the, the 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 fortunate feeling I, I have is that you know choosing a degree like education, where where you're you know, the, the, the biggest learning out of that four-year degree is not necessarily what you learned from a content perspective, but where to find information and how to yeah. facilitate conversations and how to how to bring the best out of people mm. and by taking interest. And then as a teacher, you're 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 encouraged, you're charged with taking interest in a lot of individuals, you know, in your care for those few hours each day, those few weeks in the month, those few months in a year. You have to try and get the best out of individuals own belief and and then inject mm. some content to them to continue to develop and grow and, and accelerate and become you know wonderful superhumans and work in jobs that haven't been created yet yeah you know, so, so they so that that baseline experience those first few fundamental years in my career as a, as a classroom uh, educator have played a really fundamental part for me professionally in a corporate sense because yeah, that's I, awesome. I people, people laugh at me a lot when I say I actually do more teaching I've done more teaching the last 18 years working in the corporate organization than I did in the four years. Oh, hearing you. Yeah. And, you know, because you're <laughs> yeah. applying a lot of those fundamental skills of leadership. What is it? It's taking interest. It's really, mm. it's <laughs> to me, it's taking interest in the human that you're dealing with, mm. you know, understanding what makes them tick, what makes them, what, what motivates them, what makes them engage, you know, what, what gets their juices flowing. And then, charging that with a whole heap of energy mm, <laughs> right? yeah yeah charging that whole heap of energy and then just open doors for them let them you know it, you know I always start with my teams whether I'm taking new teams or going into an organization or a new team and within the set, different parts of the business is start what do you want to do what's what's yeah. in it for you what, what's your life journey like and then from there you can sort of you can see the past you can see where the where the line is and you kind of see where the line's going to continue mm. um, and then you just sort of keep pushing, prodding and guiding and, and giving opportunities to people. And by taking interest, they then take take that as a value and then they want to give you value in return by working hard and doing their job and being accountable and yeah. delivering results. So to me, it's a, I find it a simple process, you know, but for some it's not. And I, yeah. I can also understand that uh, yeah. because they've been spending a lot of time looking at themselves and how they become leaders. I, I think my biggest leadership lesson here is, you know, be. For, I never look at myself necessarily on a daily basis and go, oh, "What do I need to do to become a better leader?" I, I allow the natural process of coaching and working with people, uh, and and their feedback is what guides my leadership and my yeah. learning journey. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that to me is is a really significant um, uh, point. I always love to share. No, that and that feedback from others I totally agree with that you know we can sit there and we can reflect but we're reflecting from our own biases anyway right so having that feedback externally is really that observation and an observation from someone else probably has so many more gold nuggets than us coming from our own internal bias of oh yeah I, I didn't do good at that but because rather than someone else going hey this is how you could have shown up and it would have been different. Oh yeah. Good point. Thanks for that. Right. And challenging us. So can you, can you probably go in another great segue to the next question? Um, what's a, a major challenge that you've experienced in your life that you're now grateful for and how did it become a benefit to you? Cause I find that, you know, we, we come across and we were talking about this before we came onto the interview, right. With some stuff with myself, like we come into these places of challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, but when we go through them, we have this learning and then we have gratitude afterwards because there's a gold nugget in everything, right? It's a gift we haven't unwrapped. Can you share yeah. something from your experience that would fit that? Yeah. One, one word that you just said, Naomi, is, is that 
sort of resonated straight away is the word bias. And, yeah. and I'll touch on the unconscious bias um, that uh, that have, I've experienced through um, uh, through professional career and even you know as a you know as a young you know immigrant kid who had yeah. dark hair coming into yeah. town full of children who have blonde and blue eyes and and surfy you know, town. Still, you came to a surfy yeah, town yeah right? surfy town like Bunbury where kids yeah. where went to school barefoot and rode yeah. their push bikes and you know I came from an environment where no one walked around barefoot and no one yeah. uh we didn't have grass ovals on in the schools in Beirut it was all concrete mm. jungles um we had a basketball court to share amongst 3,000 people you know yeah. at school a big, big massive school it was just towers of, of classrooms to a small country town primary school that had you know 100 or so kids with football field and tennis courts and basketball courts and you know so dealing with that bias of of, of trying to fit in trying yeah. to that initial challenge of uh, just the yearning of I just want to be normal so you know you know I, the first six months of moving to this country are uh, ingrained in my brain like a like a like a high definition video <laughs> like <laughs> a, like a sense of the smell of the first day of school that I had the the mm. people called by name the individuals that I spoke to when I was 11 you know and and what was said what was done and how it happened it's so vividly ingrained um at the time it probably didn't feel as positive as it did now but, yeah yeah <laughs> um, you know it was a bit more challenging not being able to communicate not being able to speak English what are they saying um you know mm-hmm. what are they thinking about me why do I look different why do I have black hair why is my hair split and and, and slick to the side was their hairs all messy and mm. and why is my shirt tucked in theirs isn't why am I wearing like a uniform but they're not yeah uh, and so that bias of just trying to how do I how do I handle you know doing this and, and then getting through that and then yeah. you know I said you know the the wonderful parenting skills and I think not by choice, but by force, really, my parents had. And mum was great at very early when I would go home crying from school, not mm. knowing what happened in those six hours, seven hours. And she would say, what are you worried about? You know, I said, I can't speak English. I don't know what they're saying. She goes, but don't worry, in a few weeks you will. Yeah. She goes, how many other languages do you speak? I said, oh, I speak Arabic at home and I know a bit of French. So she goes, you already know two languages and soon it'll be three. How many languages do other kids speak at the school? Nice. One, so straight away, this this confident booster that you've got something more than others that you don't don't let that uh, challenging experience they had of someone picking on you or pulling your hair or telling you you've got hairy legs when you're 11 or whatever it may be, yeah. Don't let that be a deterrent for you to go on your shell. No, you should embrace who you are and wear your culture on your on your sleeve and yeah. be proud to be using holding a Lebanese roll for lunch and it stunk like Zata. And <laughs> but then now you see Zata on the menu of every primary school, right? We we were sprinkling it on 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 our bread and we're dipping it in the restaurants yeah. and become common, right? But in 1988, let me tell you, no, it wasn't common in Bunbury. So yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so dealing dealing with that and fast forward to even the cultural bias you know, working for an organization like Coca-Cola company, right? And yeah. uh, the timing that I came into the business was when Coke had had uh, purchased uh, a coffee business and then were experimenting with servicing the restaurant trade, the bar trade in a different way than they would service the, the, uh, the, the supermarket. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember sitting in front of the MD and I won't mention names because probably he's very well known and yeah. he... Um, he saw my surname on on the on the meeting list, and he saw Riyashi, and he came in and and said, uh, "Does it help being Italian to sell coffee?" <laughs> right, and yeah. and then the, my manager who was there in the room sort of had to you know whisper to him very gently, <laughs> "He's not he's not Italian, he's Lebanese." And then his response was, "Same, same." Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I, I kind of went, yeah, we, yeah, from a distance, we may look the same. There's a lot yeah. of differences. It's so you know, different. Yes, it's like Australian yeah. New Zealand, right? They're Correct, the right? Same. So yeah. that that's a bias, right? That's sort of kind of kind of. Oh, if I'd said you're the same as the Irish guy next to you, would you? Would, yeah. Would you accept that? Like, how would that feel for you? You know. So yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but you know, you, you kind of you you have these 
um, these moments in life and people will not be able to pronounce your name when you jump on the phone, you know, hi, it's Bashir speaking. Who is it? Matthew? No, no, it's Bashir. Oh, is it Matthew? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's okay. It's Bob. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dealing, <laughs> yeah. dealing with those. And, and even more recently, you know, after all these years of having to, to cop that bias and, um, and I, I don't think it disadvantaged me in any way. It, it may have without me knowing, I don't know, but from 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 my life perspective, I've 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 learned to just I laugh at it, I make a joke out of it, you know, I yeah. pull the piss out of myself in front of people. So all my culture, you know, um, you know, you say Lebanese and you say, No, I'm not a terrorist, I'm not an activist, yeah. I'm I'm not <laughs> radicalized, you're okay, we're safe. Yeah, yeah, you know, I cook really good food. Come on, yeah. come on in, you know, we're we're all good. Uh, it's going so, through their stomach. I think yeah. your, I think what your mum did though was probably pivotal for where and how you are now. And I know you touched on that because it is a superpower being different. But you know, I was one of my previous interviews was with someone that's on the spectrum, right, and has that neurodivergency. And you know, when we go out into the bush, and I said this in this interview, we look for the crooked tree or the one that's unique and different. But when we look at humans, we don't see the beauty in the difference. But having your mum tell you that there's beauty in being different, I think that's probably why you come across so confident now and how you've had all of the achievements that you've had and you are people focused the way that you are. Yeah, it's it's more, it's, uh, you know, it's probably, it's put the focus on people on steroids, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's a heightened awareness for me. Yeah. And because it's been a heightened awareness, uh, it, it's like my first, you know, you know, I recall even at the school that I went to in high school, right? Like, mm. you know, I'd get an announcement about she can come to the front office. And I think, oh, my God, I haven't done anything. I, I, I'm not in trouble. I'm behaving well in the French class. Like, everything is going good. I'll get called in the office because Mrs. Cantoni has just enrolled a Russian student and, and, uh. and a Russian student who doesn't speak English. And we need you to, to just sort of shadow this person so they, A, know where the food is, they know where the toilets are, can you, you know, help them translate? Although I don't speak a word of Russian. No, no, no. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. you, know uh, you know, there was there was a Russian student, there was an Indonesian student, there was a Thai student. I can recall all these students that came into, you know, into our, our, school, our school, our high school, and yeah. it was all done under this sort of covert mission top we've got a special assignment for you to do but yeah at the time mrs cantoni and mr cantoni his in, may he rest in peace he passed away he was the principal at new more yeah they were a family that were involved in the soccer club that i was involved in involved in the tennis club that i was involved in so they yeah. had we had a relationship so they kind of knew that i had this interesting background a cultural mm. difference so whenever the students would come to the school they would say hey you were their go-to here. and they knew yeah. that i would go to the library i'll google a few words in that language or not google i would have looked it up in the encyclopedia yeah. <laughs> you know? dictionary so, a translation dictionary, dictionary. Yeah. translation whatever you know would have yeah. searched it somehow and uh yeah. Yeah. and the one computer that's out available for the whole school uh, <laughs> and and uh and then worked to what worked out a way to communicate and get these kids involved mm. and made, made them feel okay to be different mm. and it was something that i never had mm -hmm. um, so i went through that you know it's it's trauma but it's not really trauma but it was it was it was experience oh, yeah, i'd say it would be like because anything that challenges us right has a traumatic response within us and it's what we do with that right and it, and it looks like you've actually been able to come out and see that you know i can use this to serve right 100%. i can use my experience to serve others and, and that was the reason I became a school teacher. You know, I I, um, I wanted to, my, my only goal at the time uh, when I decided whether it was accounting, nursing, you know, education was to help kids who came from an overseas country settle in in a better way than I did. That was the, that was the motivator. That was wow. truly the motivator. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, and I enjoyed it, loved it, and if I had opportunities that took me away from it, but then apply a lot of those skill sets in, in everyday life. Yeah. And so what do you, what advice, tips, or tricks would you share for today's future leaders? Great question. Um, the art of listening. Yeah. You know, um, the art of listening and 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 effective communication. Um mm -hmm probably the two that stand out uh and and the one that really um uh, resonated with me is, is understanding 
what you stand for and be interested in in what others stand for and finding the, the synergy in between. Uh, so understand what your value is. What what do you bring? What do you want to be remembered for? What's your legacy item? You know, so uh, I had that that lesson shared with me by, you know, a very senior uh, at the time managing director of the business who I happened to have half an hour of his time. And I remember mm-hmm. asking him, you know, what does it take to be successful? Like I, I was really mesmerized by this guy, the way he presented to an audience, the way he spoke, it can hold like a room of 500 people with the palm of his hand. He can go into any customer, any big organization, whether the CEO or the, or the janitor, and he'd, 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 he'd engage and I was like, you know, like a lap dog. I was like, oh my god, how do I, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, yeah, how do I engage? Yeah. And he, he sort of said to me, he goes, "You're already doing it. What are you worried about? Why are you trying to be me? Be you. You know, and what do you stand Love for?" That. He goes, "What's your yeah. value proposition?" So he 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 challenged me to go away and yeah. take time, take as many as long as as long as it takes. He goes, "Just write down for you a list of what is it that means value to you." And I came up with this list. It was three things, you know, like, you know, I like to take complex scenarios and make them simple. Yeah. So I, I wrote yeah. remove complexity. Yeah. And then two, we talk about, you know, being accountable, fulfill your commitments. You know, yeah. I always had this thing about being a teacher. The bell goes at nine, make sure you're there five to nine to so we can start at nine. Yeah. And then and then three, you know, have truth and integrity. You know, if something costs you a hundred, don't don't bullshit someone and say it's 150. It's a hundred. Yeah. That's how much you paid for it, you know? So if you want it, it's a hundred. Um, yeah. And then later, uh, later I'll, I added to that and, and continue to be a lifelong learner. And that was a theme of, of the education in a degree. Right. So, mm. so they're the things I would share, understand your value, what you stand for, take a lot of interest in others because that will make you then interesting mm. and, and then be communicate and under, under sub sub, line on the communicators be a great listener yeah yeah that's awesome I love that now one of the questions that I do ask all of um, my guests is um, more about that going inward right so we all know you know there's the reflection there's feedback but there's times where we just sit in with our inner self and that gives us in my opinion the strength to come out and serve at a higher level so do you have any daily weekly or monthly practices that you do that strengthen your connection I know you did mention walking before maybe that's one of or maybe that's it I'm not sure yeah yeah um the, the sit in your shit moment right yeah yeah <laughs> so, um, yeah definitely definitely walking i find walking uh to be uh just the time where i you know i i, I put my phone on air flight mode if i'm not in a phone conversation i listen to music or i listen to a podcast yeah. um so it gives me time and you're listening to, to catching the octopus podcast aren't you of course of, of course, course. Of course. <laughs> uh, you know i've listened to you know jeff stewart's you know session with jeff and yeah. i forget the other gentleman's name uh the uh, uh from the states who was on there recently that you shared uh, chris cowan chris cowan yeah i found him very very what a great story um, oh he's so, great yeah and Jeff, Jeff's influence, although I have never met Jeff, I've, I've heard of Jeff, you know, being someone who visits the Southwest on, yeah. a, on a regular basis. And uh, I've known a lot of uh, former police officers that have gone through that Southwest precinct when I was running venues in Bunbury, you know, in Southwest, you know, you got to mm. know the local uh, police department really well yeah, um, for good reasons. Uh, so it's, um, so yeah, now nah, look, so yeah, walking, reflecting, but also just finding um, finding downtime to be solo, you know, yep. in a busy life of, you know, running a household, a family and running a family at work, um, mm. you know, having time to, you know, having that regular, um, I find regular time to have some close friends that you can talk to about anything. Yeah. Uh, and those mates that you can just say, hey, I'm having a shit week, mate. Like, yeah. can you hear me out for 10 minutes? Yeah. What do you reckon I should do here or do there? Uh, so that's usually around you know around a walk around a golf you know i do that once a month with yep. a, a number of guys i connect with and and um so i'm i'm fortunate that i'm surrounded by a wonderful group of people who i call my friends and family that i can pick up the phone and, and chat to mm. uh, but also find time to just relax and you know have a glass of wine with kirsten sometimes we do that when the kids at their dad's you know yep. uh, and then yeah the regular thing is the exercise so they're, they're the kind of there's nothing nothing structured or 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 the same every day or every week mm, I love the that. Tops, 
the types of activities that I, I find myself um, in myself reflecting and thinking about whether I've had an experience or I'm planning one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I suppose that's the whole idea of going inward, right? Is it's knowing what you need at that particular time. So, you know, being flexible and grabbing whatever's going to serve you best at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right now, you know, I find staying up really late watching Wimbledon uh, yeah, is, nice. is, is <laughs> something that I enjoy, you know, some people yeah. hate watching tennis and hate watching sport in the middle of the night. Um, Wimbledon comes once a year and, you know, yep. I, I love tennis. So um, I, I sometimes I'll watch someone I've never watched before and, and I, you know, you learn something new about how they deal with difficult scenarios and the challenge of being on the court for hours and hours and, mm. you know, in front of thousands of people. That's that's, that's another level of nervousness. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's how I do it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, look, if any of our guests want to reach out and um, connect with you or have a chat with you, what's the best way for them to find Bashir? Yeah, thanks, Naomi. Thanks for the for the platform. LinkedIn uh, is yep. is the the best way, or bashir.riashi at gmail You know, like I'm approachable. Um, yeah, happy to yep. chat with anyone. Awesome. Thank you so much for jumping on. It's been great to reconnect as well. Like um, I met Bashir in high school, so it's been quite a few years. And um, I actually saw some of the great things he's doing through LinkedIn, which prompted me to reach out. And I'm like, oh, we've gone into a so different paths, but then we've sort of coming into that same path again, and that's wanting to serve as a leader. So thank you very much for jumping on and sharing your insights. Thanks for the opportunity, Amy, and uh, great work that you're doing, mate. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And thank you all of the guests who've listened to this episode. I look forward to serving you in our next episode. Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our next episode.